the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint present. Welcome, you are in the lab room. I'm your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me on this wonderful, wonderful Wednesday afternoon. It is Wednesday, so that means it's the start of the NFL work week. For most teams, they're just getting underway, putting in the game plan. You're starting your first day of practice for most teams of the week. Of course, this season is unique. There is a Thursday night game, so those two teams are done making their final preparations. And so they're just getting ready for each other now. They're ready to square off. And, of course, those two teams will be the Seattle Seahawks, the division-leading Seattle Seahawks taking on the division-leading San Francisco 49ers. So it's going to be an NFC West showdown. Two good football teams right now that play extremely good defense. That's going to be a joy to watch. But, again, it's Wednesday, and we're here to do the Soul Survivor. I've been pretty solid on my Soul Survivor picks. I had a nail-biter a week ago. I was very disappointed in the Atlanta Falcons for playing down to the level of competition of the Oakland Raiders. But they got the win. That's all I care about. I don't care how you do it. Just get it. They got the win. So on the season right now, I'm 5 of 6 on my Soul Survivor picks. So I want to keep that going. I, the only one that I lost, again, was the New Orleans Saints dropping that game to the Kansas City Chiefs when they were up by 18 in the second half. No excuse to lose that football game at home to the lowly Chiefs. They did. That's my only loss. So I feel good about it. I feel confident about my picks. Now, I will tell you, this week, this is a tough, tough week. There are no gimmies this week. There are no layups yet. Either hand, layup, either hand last week. It was some gimmies and some bunnies. That's not the case this week. It's a tough slate of games. So let, let's get into it. Let's see who the sole survivor of week seven will be. Everyone can pick, but only one can win. Are you the sole survivor? Now, as we do every week in the sole survivor segment, I'm going to go through the whole slate of games. I want you to see every game that's being played this week so that you can analyze and kind of mentally give yourself a picture of who's playing, what the situation is, who's home, who's away. Take into consideration who they're playing. Is it a divisional matchup? And so you can see that this is probably your best option in terms of all the games on the list for picking a sole survivor of the week. If you're in a survivor pool, you just need one. You need someone to be that one game. You just need one. All it takes is one. You're not looking for three or four games. You're not looking for multiple winners. You just need that one team that's going to be able to win the football game and get you through to the next week. That's all you're trying to do in a survivor pool is its title. Survive. That's all you're trying to do. You just want to get to the next week. You'll think about next week when that comes. But this week, you just want one winner. One team. One game. One team that can get you through to the next week. So we're going to go through this whole slate of games. Not going to give you much analysis. Not going to analyze these games. We're just going to give you a quick overview. Who's playing. Why you should or shouldn't take this game as your sole survivor. And we're going to move on. So we start out on Thursday Night Football. The Seattle Seahawks traveling to the San Francisco 49ers. In what is going to be a very good competitive football game. This is family business, however. You know what my stance is on family business. So... These are two four and two teams. We're talking about two good football teams. We're talking about number one and number two in defense. Seattle Seahawks, number one in defense. San Francisco 49ers, number two in defense. Why would you want to take this game? It's family business. I don't need to explain to you why this isn't a good idea to make your soul survivor. So we're going to move on. The Dallas Cowboys are on the road traveling to Carolina to take on the Panthers. This is a funny game. 
Not funny in the sense of ha ha ha. Funny in the sense of the Dallas Cowboys are two and three on the season, under five hundred. The Carolina Panthers one and four on the season. And so these are two teams who had high aspirations for themselves coming into the season. And this season is still young. They still can turn things around. But when you looked at this game on the slate, this was going to be an exciting matchup, you know, between two teams who were supposed to be ascending. Cam Newton was supposed to have his Carolina Panthers, you know, competing for NFC South supremacy and trying to raise, you know, the level of play in Carolina and get them to the playoffs. They were talking Super Bowl in Carolina before the season started. Same in Dallas. They were talking Super Bowl in Dallas before the season started. And again, this season is long. There's a long way to go. And then we've only played six games for some, five for uh, a few others in this season. And so there's a lot of games left to be played. And the Cowboys aren't out of this thing by any stretch of the imagination. But again, coming out of the gate, they didn't expect to be two and three under 500 in week seven of the season. And so this game is funny because not a clear-cut winner here. The Panthers are coming off of a bye, so you want to kind of be cautious of that. Always beware of the team coming off of a bye with two weeks to prepare. They're getting healthy. They had a week, extra week of rest. You don't want to touch this game. You don't need to. There are other games that are more appealing than this one. Leave it alone. Baltimore Ravens at the Houston Texans. A rematch of the divisional playoff uh, matchup in the AFC from a year ago. Two teams who have started this season off at 5-1. and one. Really, do I need to tell you why this is a bad idea? I don't think so. Cleveland Browns at the Indianapolis Colts. Two teams who are going to be most likely, not etched in stone completely, but two teams who probably will be at the bottom of their respective divisions. This is a, a game between two teams who are trying to find ways to win football games. They're trying to learn how to win. Both teams have young head coaches, the Browns and Pat Shermer, who's in his second season, the Indianapolis Colts, whose head coach, Chuck Pagano, is not with the team right now, will not be with the team for the remainder of the season, as he is dealing with a bout of leukemia. One that is a treatable form. However, still, he is dealing with leukemia and hopes to be back on the Colts sideline next year. Let's continue to pray for him and his family that he is able to recover from this bout with leukemia. But he's a first-year head coach. The man taking his place, Bruce Arians, never been a coach in the National Football League, has been an offensive coordinator for many years, but never been a head coach. So, young coaches, young quarterbacks, Two rookie quarterbacks squaring off. Two of the starting five are going at it in Brandon Whedon for the Cleveland Browns. And first overall pick in the 2012 NFL Draft, Andrew Luck in the Indianapolis Colts. Two young quarterbacks. Two teams who are relatively young looking to win football games. No. 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 Arizona Cardinals at the Minnesota Vikings. Now, normally, this would not be the most ideal pick for a sole survivor because normally there's better games, more easier games to analyze and pick a winner from. But in this week, week seven of the National Football League in the 2012 season, this is the best you have to offer. So ding, 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 ding. This is your sole survivor for week seven. The Minnesota Vikings are coming off of a loss to the Washington Redskins in week six. Hot fought ball game, one that they started out the game dominating but didn't have the points to show for it. It ended up coming back to bite them in the tuckus, and they ended up losing that football game to a very diverse offense in the Washington Redskins. Meanwhile, the Arizona Cardinals were at home a week ago in week six against the Buffalo Bills, a team who had been struggling mightily. On the road, those Bills went into Arizona, a team that had been playing solid football this season, sporting a record at the time of 4-1. and one. And they let the Bills come in there and take the fight to them, make it a close ball game, and eventually steal the game from the Cardinals. That was a very disheartening loss if you're a Cardinals fan, if you're a Cardinals player, if you're a Cardinals coach. That's a loss that you can't afford to have. 
especially when you're jockeying in a tough NFC West division. To make matters worse, to add insult to injury, <laughs> they lost Kevin Cobb in that game. And we just found out that he's not going to be available for probably the next two, three, maybe even four weeks with a rib injury. Remember, he hurt his ribs in the preseason. So he's probably re-aggravated an injury that was a previous injury from the preseason. And now he's going to miss some significant playing time. Now you have to turn to John Skelton, who I have to admit, I hate doing this, but I have to admit, I was a proponent of starting John Skelton to start the season. Boy, was I wrong. Kevin Cobb was what this team needed. And now that John Skelton is being thrown back into the starting position as the Cardinals quarterback, you saw what he did last week. He was, pu he was putrid. He threw up all over himself, cost the Arizona Cardinals the game. I don't trust him. I don't trust either one of those quarterbacks, but I trust Kevin Cobb more than I trust John Skelton. And for that reason, that reason alone, we're not even talking Minnesota Vikings. For that reason and that reason alone, you can't trust the Arizona Cardinals in this football game. You have to assume that they're going to go on the road and absolutely lay an egg. If they couldn't beat Buffalo at home, what makes you think they're going to go on the road, nonetheless, and beat the Minnesota Vikings, who have been playing good football all this season? They lost a week ago, but they played good enough to beat most teams in the National Football League. 26 points is nothing to scoff at. They scored 26 points. Their defense got shredded, but they played a very diverse Washington Redskins offense a week ago. A team that throws a lot at you offensively, and it's hard to stop. This Arizona Cardinals team is very vanilla on offense. They don't run the football. They have no running game with which to speak of. Their passer is their passing game, their quarterback situation is one of the worst in the National Football League. So they should be able to be stopped by a Minnesota Vikings defense that came into the uh, week last week as the seventh ranked defense in the league that probably was um, dropped a few notches after the Redskins, you know, were able to compile some offense against them. But nonetheless, this is a good Vikings defense. This is a sound Vikings offense that doesn't turn it over uh, that often. And this is a Vikings team that if you're not careful and sound in your principles, they'll run back a kick or a punt return on you. No problems. And so the Vikings have done a good job of winning football games this season. By winning two of the three aspects of the game. Whether it's been offense, defense, defense, offense, or special teams and defense. They found a way to win two of the three um, facets of the game. And normally, if you do that in conjunction with winning the turnover battle, you're going to win a lot of football games in the National Football League. And that's what the Vikings have been able to do. That's what I expect them to do against the Arizona Cardinals at home. So, your sole survivor for the week. Week 7 in the National Football League, it's going to be the Arizona Cardinals losing to the Minnesota Vikings. So in essence, take the Minnesota Vikings as your sole survivor this week. But we'll continue to go down the slate of games so that you see that while this probably, on most weeks, wouldn't be the most ideal of choices, you really don't have an option this week. There are no layups. There are no gimmies on this schedule. This is as close as you're going to get. So we go on to the next football game that sees the Tennessee Titans traveling to Buffalo to take on the Bills. Now, I've washed my hands clean of the Buffalo Bills. So that win last week really upset my stomach because they're not a good football team in my eyes, and they're, they're not supposed to win too many more games. Well, they went on the road and beat an Arizona Cardinal team that had been playing, for the most part, pretty good football. So that kind of dispelled my whole notion of the Bills just tanking it and and just descending to the bottom of the AFC East division. They got a big win last week, and they, just like the rest of the teams in that AFC East division, are all 3-3. Three and three. So Buffalo is going home this week for the first time in, in three weeks because the last two weeks they went out west. They played the 49ers. They played the Arizona Cardinals. So now they travel all the way back east. They finally get to play a home game. They welcome in the Tennessee Titans who, last week, beat the Steelers at home on Thursday Night Football, a very impressive win. And so you don't really know what you're getting out of the Tennessee Titans because Matt Hasselbeck will be the quarterback again for the third consecutive week because Jake Locker isn't ready to come back from injury. And you saw what his veteran leadership, his veteran presence brings to the table for the Tennessee Titans. So you really don't know where to go, where to lean, because I don't trust Buffalo. 
I still think they're not that good of a football team. Tennessee is still trying to find their way. Chris Johnson had a solid showing last week. But again, he's been missing one week, found the next week. Missing again the next week, located again. So you don't know if Chris Johnson is going to have 11 carries for 32 yards this week or if he's going to have 19 carries for 100 and 27 yards. You don't know which Chris Johnson you get. You don't know what Tennessee Titans offense or defense you're going to get. You don't know what Buffalo Bills team is going to show up. Translation, don't choose this game. Next up on the docket, the Washington Redskins traveling to the New York Giants. Family business. The Giants are 4-2, and two, Redskins 3-3. Three and three. This is a game who will decide who's going to be in first place. Leave it alone. Family business. New Orleans Saints taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Saints coming off of a bye. They got their first win of the season two weeks ago against the San Diego Chargers. They go on a bye. Now they had two weeks to prepare for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Oh, by the way, this is family business. Buccaneers got a win last week against the lowly Kansas City Chiefs. They're at home. Saints have struggled this year. Forget the fact that they won a game two weeks ago. They've struggled all year. Okay, This isn't the same New Orleans Saints from last year, from two years ago, from three years ago. They're struggling. And even though they won a game, I still don't trust them. Neither should you. Family business. Keep your nose out of it. Move on. Green Bay Packers at the St. Louis Rams. The Packers here are playing more inspired football. They started to adopt this me against the world mentality. Everybody's thinking we're done. We're not playing good football. We're going to use that to fuel us to win football games. They're too good of a football team to need any of that to win games. The Saints, or excuse me, the Rams on the opposite side of the field are at home in this game, which makes this game less appealing because if the Packers were home against the Rams, I say you take this game. But the Packers are on the road, and we've seen what the Packers can do on the road. They can lay an egg, as they did two weeks ago against the Indianapolis Colts. We see what the Rams can do when they're home, as they did against the Seattle Seahawks, a 4-2 and team in their division. They beat the Arizona Cardinals, a team they throttled, who was undefeated in that matchup, who they beat. They're a different team at home. They beat the Redskins at home. All three of their wins this year at home. All three of their losses on the road. So, if you're looking at this game and saying, hey, the Packers lit the Houston Texans up, who were an undefeated team on Sunday Night Football. They were on the road. They went into Houston, beat them up, looked like the team that we thought they were going to be coming into the season. Why not pick this game? Because the Packers are on the road. Because the Rams are at home. The Rams have played really good football at home this season. The Packers have not played great football on the road this season. Why would you want to go there? Leave this game alone. Moving on, the Jets are going to take on the New England Patriots. This is an old-fashioned AFC East family affair. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. This is the Jets and the Patriots. This is their business. This is family business. You have no say-so in this. Leave it alone. Jacksonville Jaguars taking on the Oakland Raiders. These are two suspect football teams. Two of the worst teams in the league. When it's all said and done, and we start talking about draft order next season, who's going to pick first, who's going to pick second, who's going to pick seventh in the draft, these two teams here playing on this game will be in the top five. If not the top five, in the top seven. Guarantee you that. So, me telling you that lets you know these are two bad football teams. The Raiders are probably a little bit better than the Jacksonville Jaguars because they have a quarterback that's actually good. They play a small semblance of defense. And they're at home. So, the Raiders are probably going to win this game. But that doesn't matter. You can't trust the Raiders because they're not a good football team. You can't trust the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're coming off a bye. They've had two weeks to prepare for the Raiders. And they got a little bit healthy. So you got to watch out for them because they might have a couple tricks up their sleeve. But it's two bad teams playing against each other. Why would you want to make a choice there? Why would you want to make yourself susceptible to losing a football game between two bad teams? Never put yourself in that position. So you move on. Pittsburgh Steelers 
traveling to Cincinnati to take on a divisional foe in the Cincinnati Bengals. You hear the key phrase I just said? Divisional foe, which means this is family business, which means it's not your business. It's family business, which means you need to keep your nose out. So we go to Monday Night Football. That was the Sunday night matchup. This is the Monday night matchup, which sees the Detroit Lions traveling to this key phrase, divisional foe, Chicago Bears on the road. So Detroit is heading to Chicago to take on the Bears. Bears coming off of a bye week, playing really good football. They're 4-1, leading that NFC North division. Meanwhile, the Detroit Lions got a big win on the road a week ago against the Philadelphia Eagles in comeback fashion. And so, it's family business. The key phrase there was divisional foe. That means it's family business. Once again, the Bears are probably the superior team here and their home, which makes this game very, very appealing at first glance. However, this is family business. You throw all that other stuff out the window when we're talking family business. Let's not forget, these Detroit Lions are a very talented football team. And they have Megatron. Heavens to Megatron. Why would you want to touch this game? It's family business. You know how I feel about it. I don't know how you feel about it. You know how I feel about it. So I tell you, I'm leaving it alone. You should do the same. So with that being said, we went through the whole slate of games. Every single game is going to be tightly contested, or at least at first glance is going to be tightly contested. There are no layups on this week seven slate of games. There are no layups. So what I've given you is your best option to move on in your soul survivor, in your soul survivor pool. If you are in a survivor pool, I've given you your best option for week seven. So there you have it. If you didn't get it the first time, if you didn't get it the second time, I'm going to give it to you again. Your soul survivor for week seven is the Minnesota Vikings. Take the Minnesota Vikings over the Arizona Cardinals. So, for the last time, week seven, sole survivor is the Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings are. So that's a touchdown. Throw it up. I'm going to tack on this quick extra point. And I actually have a two-point conversion today. Not just a simple extra point. I'm going for two. We're going for two today. Ray Lewis, if you've been following the National Football League, which I know you have if you're tuning into this program, he injured himself on Sunday, and he's gone for the season. Him and Ladarius Webb both injured themselves. Ladarius Webb tearing his ACL. He's gone for the season. Ray Lewis tearing his tricep. He's gone for the season. But Ray Lewis's injury is a little different because he was, we were already talking about, was this going to be Ray Lewis's last season? Now he has this injury, and now you, you stop to wonder, was that the last time we were going to see Ray Lewis on a National Football League field? Is that the last image we'll have of Ray Lewis walking off the field, clutching his arm? I'm here to tell you, I seriously doubt it. Ray Lewis is such a competitor, such a fierce competitor that I don't think he wants to allow himself to go out that way. Now, if his body will respond and allow him to come back, I think he will. What do you think? I want to know what you think. Do you think Ray Lewis has played his last game in the National Football League? I don't think so. I find it hard to believe that a man of Ray Lewis's ability, because he was still playing football at a high level, he led his team in tackles when he got injured. A man of his character. You're not saying that if he decides to retire, he lacks character. That's not what I'm saying. But you know Ray Lewis is a, is a man that he, he, he's not going to stand for someone making him lead the game on anything other than his terms. You know, Philip Tanner got up after that play, after he lowered his helmet into Ray Lewis and was, for the most part, talking trash. 
I don't think Ray Lewis wants that to be the last image you see of him on a football field. I just don't think that that's who Ray Lewis is. I don't think that's how his mind is wired. I don't think he's going to allow that to be the last time you see him on a National Football League field. If he walks away from the game, he wants it to be on his terms. He wants to walk away from the game because he can't do it anymore. Not because he got injured and he didn't have the will to, to get back from this injury and come back and give it a go. We're going to see, though. We'll know what you think. What is Ray Lewis going to do? Do you think he's going to retire or you think he's going to come back? I think he's going to come back. If the Ravens will allow it, I think he'll be back. And I say if the Ravens allow it because they have say-so in this. If they were to cut ties with Ray Lewis, I think they would save themselves something like 2 or $3 million on the cap. So that's a big decision. That's a lot of money. You know, depending on what you're looking for, that's two, three, three players maybe. You know, taking up cap space and just holding on to Ray Lewis. So I don't know. We'll see. Want we'll to know what you think, though. Also, have another question to pose. Watching that same game, the Ravens and the Cowboys, on Sunday. This is two consecutive weeks that the Ravens have been absolutely gashed on the ground. Two weeks ago, the Chiefs let them have it to the tune of over 200 yards rushing. It's, albeit in a loss because the Chiefs stink and can't score points. The following week, everybody thought that that was an anomaly. The Ravens weren't going to allow that to happen again. And then it happened again, this time at home. The Chiefs' 200-yard debacle happened in Kansas City. This time, they were home in the friendly confines of M&T Bank Stadium. And they gave up well over 200 yards to the tune of 220-something yards to the Dallas Cowboys on the ground. So I pose this question to you. As a fan, what more? which is more demoralizing? Seeing your team be gassed on the ground or seeing your team give it up in the air? As a player, it's probably more demoralizing to see your team give it up on the ground because having a team run on you, knowing they're going to run and you can't stop it, that's an element of manhood. It, it takes a lot out of you mentally and physically. When a team tells you, I'm lining up, I'm putting big personnel on the field, putting two backs in the backfield, one blocking fullback, and the other a tailback, my big guys against yours, we're going to win. It's demoralizing to have someone tell you that, line up in front of you, tell you it's a running play, and you can't stop it. It's also... However, equally as devastating to see your defense be able to get the opposing team to third and long, third and seven, third and eight, third and nine, third and 13, and repeatedly give it up on third down through the air. Repeatedly give up long passing plays, plays of over 20 yards, plays of over 40 yards, big chunk plays, big explosive plays through the air. As we all know, points are scored through the passing game in the National Football League for the most part. It's tough to watch that occur over and over and over again. So which one do you deem as being the worst? Having your team be gashed on the ground or having your team be exposed over and 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 over again through the air? Which one is worse? I struggle with that because points are scored through the passing game. Nothing worse than stopping a team on the first two downs only to give it up on third down. Tough to, to win football games going away because teams always have the ability to come back, score quickly, quick strike you, and get back in the football game. But on the flip side of that, tough to stomach being able to be ran on at all times of the football game, especially late. Nothing worse than finding yourself down 
10 points late in the ball game, getting a late score, cutting the lead to three. Now you need one stop. There's four minutes and 47 seconds left on the clock and having the team bleed the clock because you can't stop the run. Having them run over and over and over again. First down. Over and over and over again. First down. Over and over and over again. First down until they bleed the clock out. Had it happened to my favorite team, the Washington Redskins, about three, four years ago against the uh, Dallas Cowboys where Marion Barber just absolutely took over in the fourth quarter. They lined up. Every play told us Marion Barber is getting the football and we couldn't stop it. That's tough to stomach. So I struggle with this one. Which one's worse? What do you think? That's my extra point for the day. That's my two-point conversion. Had two for you. That's my two-point conversion. So think about those. I'd love to hear some responses from you out there. Which one's worse? Is Ray Lewis coming back? And which one's worse? And that's going to do it for this episode of In the Lab Room. I thank you for joining me again. You can contact me numerous ways. One being via email, in the lab room at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Drop something in the inbox. I'm also on Twitter at in the lab room is the Twitter handle. And I'm on Facebook. Like me on Facebook. In the lab room is the Facebook page. Like it. Communicate with me on Facebook. Leave me a message. I'll definitely get back to you. I check it all the time. And again, I thank you for tuning into the program. Hope to hear from you. And again, I want to see you back here, same time, same place. I thank you for joining me on this program. See you tomorrow. Have a good one.